Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon Ferris, the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at CEREC. Welcome to today's webinar. I am coming from you to you live from Canada, where it's Monday evening. So good evening to all of our North American participants who are working late tonight to watch this webinar with us. And of course, in Asia Pacific, it's Tuesday morning. So good morning, everyone. We're happy to deliver a webinar at a time that is convenient to you on the other side of the world. We are also pleased to have so many of you with us today. In fact, we have more than 1,700 registrations for this new webinar series with the authors of the Career Theories and Models at Workbook. And today, we are absolutely delighted to have Jim Bright with us from Australia. Jim will talk about his chaos theory of careers and how the theory relates to the global pandemic and the uncertainty that it has created in so many people's lives. But before Jim gets started, we would like to take a few moments to introduce you to CEREC and share some housekeeping notes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our work at CEREC, we are a charitable organization that focuses on education and research in career counseling and career development in Canada. We fund projects that create new knowledge and develop innovative resources like the Career Theories and Models at Workbook. We also have three main programs, the Connexus Career Development Conference that we normally do in Ottawa, Canada each year, but this year will be a little bit different since we'll host Connexus in a fully virtual format, so even our colleagues from Australia or other parts of the world can join us. And you could visit our Connexus website if you want to register, and in particular to benefit from the early bird rate before the November 12th deadline. In terms of other CEREC programs, we also produce the careerwise.ca website, which features the top news and views in the career development field, along with a French version called orientation.ca. And finally, we publish the peer-reviewed Canadian Journal of Career Development, which is also free to access. You could learn more about all of CEREC's work and resources by visiting our website at CEREC.ca. Also, because CEREC is always looking at new webinars and learning opportunities for you, we would greatly appreciate if you could share your feedback on this webinar as well as on your future learning needs in the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of today's session. And thank you in advance for taking the time to do that. Now, some very quick, quick housekeeping notes. If during today's webinar you have any questions or comments, please enter them in the questions box that you see on your screen. We'll have a Q&A session where Jim will address your questions near the end of today's webinar. And also note that we will send you the recording from today's webinar along with the presentation slides in the coming days. Now I would like to introduce Nancy Arthur, who is also live with us today from Australia. Nancy is one of the three co-editors of the Career Theories and Models at Workbook. And without the tremendous work of the editors, which include Mary McMahon, Roberta borgen No, and Nancy, the book wouldn't have been brought to life. So we are so delighted to have Nancy with us today to say a few words about the book and to introduce Jim Bright. Over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Sharon. And hello, everyone, to colleagues joining us from many different uh, countries and and, and uh, cities, towns from around the world. It's, it's very exciting to be uh, here this morning to uh, say a, a hello, a warm hello to, to everyone. Um, and thanks for taking the time for joining to, to join this professional development event. This is the 11th webinar that CEREC has sponsored based on our project, Career Theories <clears throat> and Models at Work Ideas for Practice. You know, things begin with an idea. And uh, co colleagues, Mary and Roberta and I had an idea that theory needed to be more practical. We uh, noticed that uh, uh, many conferences uh, were, uh, had few sessions that were devoted to, to theory. And we had been instructors in many, many different uh, career development uh, programs and courses over the years. What we also noticed was the absence of, of material, written material, that bridged theory to practice. So we set out with an idea that we would develop a book that would feature contemporary theories for use in practice. Well, that idea grew into a big project as we approached Sarah, uh, who funded us for a project through one of their, their learning projects. What happened was we aimed for 30 chapters, with each chapter featuring a, a novel, a new uh, theory, 
uh, or model of career development. Some of the chapters feature traditional uh, ones that have been around for a long time, but are really um, written in a way that serve you well in contemporary practice. So 43 chapters, authors from nine different countries later, we produced a book that we hope will be very useful to you in practice. So I want to thank my collaborators, um, Mary McMahon and Roberta, excuse me, Borgen Noel for, for such a collaborative project. And as well, a big thanks to Sarek for your support of the book and also this webinar series. Let's go to the next slide there, Sharon. Okay, so this morning, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Bright. Now, I've known Jim for a number of years as we've met at different conferences and venues, and I never quite know what Jim is going to talk about. Well, I do. He's going to talk about his work <clears throat> on, as the co-author of The Chaos Theories of Careers. But I've noticed that every presentation that Jim gives is slightly different. I've appreciated his sense of humor and the playful way in which he takes up very serious issues in the world and offers practical suggestion. Jim is a professor uh, in career guidance and development at the Australian Catholic University based in Sydney. Um, Jim's work on the chaos theory of careers is kept alive because of his own practical work as a psychologist, as a consultant, and as a trainer. So Jim, I look forward to hearing um, your presentation today. I can think of no other time where we could all uh, all benefit from some better understanding of, uh, around what to do in a chaotic world. So we're looking forward to your presentation today as we, in the context of the chaos th theory of careers in a post-COVID world. Thank you so much for joining us today for Sarek's 11th webinar on career theories and models at work, ideas for practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nancy. That's a very generous introduction. Um, I'm just trying to see whether, there we go, um, my screen's up and thank you um, all for um, joining me this afternoon or, or this morning um, around the world. It's uh, very humbling that you should uh, show an interest uh, in this work, but I'm very pleased um, that uh, you have. Um, what I want to do today is take you, take you through um, the chaos theory of careers uh, and um, I'll link it along the way to these um, uncertain times uh, that uh, that we're living in. Um, but before I, I go much further, I, I really want to acknowledge um, the debt that I'll never be able to repay to um, my great friend, uh, mentor and colleague, Robert Pryor. Um, the ideas being presented here today are as much his as mine, the interpretation of those ideas today um, and all of the mistakes uh, and crassness are mine, not Robert's. But I do want uh, to recognize the contribution that Robert has made to career development um, over many, many uh, decades. Um, and the chaos theory of careers would not be here today if it was not for his wisdom and tenacity and erudition. So I really want to say thank you uh, for your contribution, Robert, it's um, it's been immense. Um, so we're going to talk about um, chaos uh, and and careers. And I guess the the first point that I I want to make um, is that we live in uncertain times. And I suppose a lot of you might be forgiven for saying, well, duh, yeah, um, you know, that seems a pretty obvious comment to make, but. You know, uh, it's not always been the case that people have been so readily persuaded um, of that. Um, and I and I guess one of the things that's happened this year is I've had to feel uh, to resist the urge to say, told you so. <laughs> um, and this is something that um, I have um, I have said uh, a few times before. As along with Robert, um, going back almost 20 years, and these are just some random slides from our presentation. The shift happens. We need to balance order and change. Life is uncertain, uh, and yeah, chaos can be found all over the place. Um, 
I think people now recognize that chaos um, occurs and uncertainty uh, occurs in, in our lives. Uh, I remember once, um, uh, I think it was Mark Zavikas who, who said to me at a conference, he said, since you guys started working on chaos, um, you know, there's been all, all kinds of different uh, world events. There have been um, an, an enormous negative events such as acts of terrorism, which fundamentally changed how people live their lives. There have been, there have been floods, there have been all kinds of things. You know, he said, you should never have started your work. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that we have a causal relationship to these events, but they, they do happen. And I think one of the issues in our field has been that we have um, exaggerated the degree of certainty in people's lives. Um, to a point in some cases where you'd be forgiven for thinking everything is predictable and everything can be planned. Uh, and I think this is um, a mistake. And I think that life has got a um, terrible way of reminding us that, in fact, you know, um, it's in charge and it's not us to some degree. Um, and I think this is reflected in, in how we, we tend to deal um, with uncertainty. Um, and I think um, there are kind of four, at least four different uh, approaches that people uh, tend to adopt when they think about uncertainty. Um, and uh, the first one is to reduce or eliminate it. So, and this is, and this is your, your classic planning type of approach. So you try to minimize sources of uncertainty as much as possible or try to eliminate it um, in, entirely. And in a sense, if you may have heard arguments about people's approaches to dealing with uh, COVID and governments have taken various different uh, approaches. Um, and one contrast we hear a lot in this part of the world is between countries like uh, New Zealand, who, have, who adopted a strategy of trying to entirely eliminate the presence of the virus uh, in the community and compare that with countries like Sweden, where um, they have uh, gone more for what's called herd immunity or let it rip through to some degree. And people have been debating the merits and wisdom of, of each approach. And then another approach to uncertainty is to manage it. And, and I think a lot of countries um, have adopted this kind of approach in terms of trying to deal with the virus and many other forms of uncertainty. But again, it always comes back to this kind of notion of planning and, and trying to predict. And I think what we're seeing with, with COVID is a, is a case study in uncertainty. Uh, and just when you think it's OK to go outside, as the, the old movie line goes, um, we get hit by the second or the third wave. Um, and we see exactly the same thing um, right down to the individual level from the societal level that um, as I understand it with the time course of the, that illness, um, you, can, you can feel okay, you can get a diagnosis, you can still feel okay, and suddenly around about the seventh day, you can suddenly um, dramatically decline in, term, in terms of your health. Um, other people can get symptoms and, and be quite ill pretty quickly. Some people have mild or next to no symptoms despite being positive. It is, and it seems to be very difficult to be able to predict who's going to um, get what, when, how, for how long, and for how severely. Um, and this is in, in microcosm. This this illustrates um, the uncertainty due to the, the the complexity, due to the limitations of our knowledge, and this this applies not only to, to very sad and, and very tragic and serious things like COVID, but it applies throughout our lives in our view. And I say, this is something that we have been talking about now um, for 20 years, that the first published paper on the chaos stuff in a journal was in 2003. We've been presenting this stuff at conferences from the early 2000s and thinking about these ideas in the late 90s. Um, the third uh, approach is, is embracing uncertainty. So rather than trying to eliminate it or, or manage it away or try to control it, it, it embracing uncertainty uh, entails uh, accepting our limitations, accepting the limitations of personal control, accepting the limitations of societal control and recognizing that life is inherently uncertain and therefore careers um, are also um, uncertain. 
And of course, the final way, and you'll always find a group of people who do this, you, is denial. It's, simple, it's simply a refusal to uh, accept um, that uh, the uncertainty exists. And, you know, again, sadly, we're seeing this in, in relation to COVID with people trying to argue that, you know, it's a conspiracy or it, it, it doesn't exist, it's all invented, or even if it does exist at the very best, it, it is it's just a very trivial and, and minimal thing. And, and whenever it seems to me that, that something unexpected or uncertain happens, you end up with a whole bunch of people who, and you, thankfully the minority in the all cases, who, who refuse to believe what's in front of them. Um, and in fact, when you, you look at things like the grieving process, denial is often the first stage of trying to uh, get to acceptance of, of what has happened. We, we carry on as though nothing has happened or we try to. Um, so that it's definitely part of our human psyche to, to behave uh, in this way, at least for a proportion of society. It is unusual for, for this to continue, and I would say it's dysfunctional. Um, I've, I've, I'm using traffic lights as a metaphor. This seems to be quite a, a popular metaphor at the moment, particularly around, around COVID. And I've kind of labeled these things in terms of um, the green, if you like, is the third option, embracing uh, uncertainty. The, uh, I'm using pink rather than amber because I've got a yellow background uh, to indicate that the second best would be to try to manage or reduce. And the, w the worst thing you can do is to um, is to deny. Um, in terms of um, linking this to career counselling and career coaching, the the reduction or uh, elimination. Uh, idea or the idea of managing it and therefore planning and predicting. This I associate with traditional career counselling or career education approach. You know, the emphasis is so strongly you've got to have goals, you've got to make a plan, um, and you know, uh, you want, you've got to be able to answer the question, where will I be in five years' time? Um, this is all very, very seductive and very attractive for people. Uh, and clearly, at some level, it is important to have some sense of direction. Um, and I think this is one of the interesting um, kinds of arguments, because if you start to challenge this approach, if you start to challenge planning and predicting, very commonly, very commonly, the response to that will be people say, well, you're, you're, you're suggesting we should we should just do do nothing. So they look at it in very black and white terms and think if it's if it's not about um, reducing if it's not about planning and predicting or managing or reducing, eliminating the problem, then you're denying it. Uh, and there's no middle route. There's no middle way uh, with all of this. Um, and I think that in itself is a mistake and it becomes a rather rigid way um, of, of thinking about the issue and perhaps explains why we have been so attached to this idea. Everybody loves a plan. Everyone loves to think that they know where they're going. You know, it gives us a tremendous sense of confidence and well-being if we have that sense that we know what's around the corner. Um, Unfortunately, we would argue that that is to some degree illusionary, um, and we don't want to exaggerate that. We don't, uh, but I, I, I think the danger is that we can become far too reliant on a plan or on a plan B, on, on the contingency plan. And I think, again, if you look at how events have unfolded uh, with, with the COVID situation, um, there's been all kinds of unexpected issues associated with the planning, which has been demonstrated to be, you know, uh, insufficient. There has been people stockpiling toilet paper or, or, or um, paracetamol um, early on in um, this process in many, many different countries, this panic buying kind of behavior. There have been shortages of, uh, of medication. There have been problems with track and tracing systems, which have been unanticipated. Um, you know, things haven't happened in the way uh, that they were expected to happen. Either things have been better than people predicted or things have been considerably, considerably worse. Um, the other approach is this freezing, denial, uh, do nothing. And equally, we think this is um, not uh, not a, a sensible approach either. Um, what we argue is that we need to embrace chaos. And that means we move from plan and predict to continual planning. 
So we're not saying you should not have plans. That's not what we're saying at all. But we point to the fact that plans are inherently limited. And consequently, we need to be going through a continual process of planning and revision and changing and being prepared to abandon plans. In fact, one of the things that we've recommended over the years is teaching people um, what we call kind of planmanship, a bit like pen, uh, penmanship, teaching people how to use a pen, teaching people how to deploy plans and how to abandon plans or how to copy somebody else's plan or how to modify or refine their plan or put their plan on ice or when, when's it time to implement their plan. These strategic decisions, teaching people how to be strategic about their plans is something I think we very rarely do in career education or coaching or counseling. Yet it's something that people are constantly dealing with and often can uh, be a key factor in people's success or failure in, in say, work situations. You know, you know knowing um, when to fold uh, in a game of cards uh, often is a very um, advantageous strategy and it keeps you in the game. Um, do we teach people this explicitly? I'm not sure that we do. I'm not sure in our rush to have a plan and a certain and definite answer, whether we actually bring in these sorts of ideas. The second part of that that is really implied by this continual planning cycle is experimentation and risk taking. In a sense, everything is a risk. Um, it's funny, an example, those of you who have been in my classes over the years may have heard me saying, that even crossing the road is a risk. I, I work in a lot of medical legal um, areas and I see people who have been you know, run down by cars. Um, I was just saying before we started, I'm lucky to be here today uh, in, my, in my rush at the weekend to get across the road to buy some vinyl records on record store day in Australia. Um, I, I got halfway across a four lane uh, road when my uh, Achilles seems to have snapped and I fell like a heap in the floor. Unfortunately, there was a van coming towards me at the time, uh, and uh, it had the undignified and painful scrabble across two lanes to get out of its way to get to the other side. So we can't even be uh, sure, especially with my legs, whether I'll get to the other side of the road or not. Um, and it can have all kinds of uh, unplanned um, consequences. So constantly, everything is a risk, even if we think it isn't, even if we're taking all of the precautions. Um, things can, uh, there are inherent risks in things. Equally, we need to be able to take risks. The danger is that we, by reducing and eliminating or trying to manage uncertainty, we stop taking risks. Um, and, a, and, a, and a good example of that in a way uh, is that um, in trying to manage, say, COVID, we, we, we go into periods of lockdown. Now, of course, that has caused all kinds of frustrations for people um, because, for instance, when you lock down a whole country, there might be hotspots where it's a really sensible strategy because there's a lot of community uh, spread. Whereas in, say, rural or remote areas, there may be no cases at all, may never have been any cases, and that therefore the risk is um, way, way, way lower. And now you begin to see things like regional lockdowns, a, a sort of um, a refinement of this kind of approach. So it, constant experimentation is absolutely essential. And of course, we know experimentation is the foundation of science. That's how we develop scientific knowledge. Um, we're saying that this is what we do in life. Con continual experiments is important. And taking risks, not being reckless, but recognizing that sometimes you need to take a risk if you want to actually change or develop. So this is... Um, leads us to this middle path of embracing uncertainty to the chaos theory of careers. Um, the theory um, really was a reaction uh, that myself and Robert felt, and there were other people around at the same time saying similar things, that the, the, the theories that were popular at the time were too static and reductionist. They, they, they didn't actually have any account of change yet change seems to be one of the most fundamental things in career development. And in fact, we're in the change business. That's what we're trying to do is help people change. They're reductionists in the sense that they tended to boil down uh, the complexity of a person's life to very simple propositions, like for instance, personality traits. And the idea is that somehow um, you can reduce a person to these, these very simple building blocks, and that will give you enough information to be able to make decisions uh, to inform plans and to advise about next steps. 
Uh, and we felt that this this denial of complexity was an oversimplification. Simplification can be very helpful, but when you oversimplify something, uh, you lose very important information, which might actually be critical in a per individual situation. We also felt that these theories are very individually centered as well. The person is at the center of this. And of course, in a sense, when you're counseling someone and they're talking about their problems, they may well feel in a sense that they are the center of their, their, their world and their, and their situation. Um, but it fails to recognize that we, you know, we are all intimately connected and part of much bigger systems. Even if we're feeling isolated or we're feeling lonely, we are, we are still in connection and those connections serve not only to support us but they also hold us they tie us uh, and they can constrain us and they can also influence us this is how viruses spread we're connected whether we like it or not and we need to recognize that we need to recognize this broader context in which we live our lives because these things matter a lot and of course this seems self-evident when you think about it in terms of careers because so much of career work is tied up with, not exclusively, but is tied up with paid employment. Well, employers exist and companies and organizations and other employees and colleagues exist. And these people can open doors for you or can become the barriers in terms of your career. Clearly, it's not simply all about us. There's also uh, other ideas based in that that flow from that kind of idea that if it's not all about us, if it's about others as well, then is what we're doing about serving others and leading others and is it about contribution? So you can start to introduce, I suppose, more uh, spiritual kind of notions and, 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 and foster and recognize that in people's thinking. It disregards chance. It disregards the fact that unplanned events can and will and do happen. Most theorists just simply do not talk about that with a notable exception at the time of um, my dear friend, late John Crumbolds, who uh, with his happenstance learning theory, uh, who was an early pioneer of the idea of chance events being centrally important in terms of careers, way ahead of nearly all other theorists on in this point. Compare um, John's brilliant thinking on this with, for instance, Donald Super in the 1950s, who wrote and dismissed chance events in his seminal book, on one page, he raises the possibility and then dismisses it and saying that no, you can, it's all a matter of statistics and you can calculate the probabilities and therefore we're in control. The hubris I see in that statement is, is amazing. Um, most of the theories I felt uh, or we felt were, were not necessarily capturing reality and a good theory needs to capture reality. That's what it is. It's an account of reality. That's what a theory is. And consequently, um, you need a theory which describes the world as it is, not as some idealized laboratory um, kind of uh, proposition. And finally, one of the key kind of central ideas uh, in our field for a long time is this notion of matching people, typically based on something like interest. Um, when you start to examine the evidence for that, it is not as impressive as perhaps uh, we would require for holding on to such an idea so closely and so intimately. Um, there's lots of evidence to suggest that it that people doing jobs um, that seem to be a match with their interests are no better adjusted, no better performing, no happier than people who are doing a job for which there is no match, for instance. So it's not just about matching. I'm not dismissing the notion entirely, but I'm saying there's a lot more to it than, than simply that. So these were some of the sorts of ideas that uh, were floating around when we were talking about the chaos theory of careers. Um, in terms of chance events, for instance, somewhere between two thirds and, and all people have experienced a chance event that significantly influences their career. I have to say the 100% is, is the figure that um, John Crumpholtz used to like to, to use and used to like to insist upon. Uh, and I, I do remember um, sitting on the floor in San Francisco in a packed workshop that John was running with um, my friend and colleague, Norm Amundsen. And uh, John was uh, had picked on the five people out of 100 in the room who said that a chance event hadn't occurred in their lives. And John was busily and enthusiastically convincing them um, otherwise. And, and Norm remarked to me, he said he's undermining his own theory. You'd expect by chance that five out of 100 wouldn't have had a chance event. But uh, whatever figure you go with, um, 
it is the common experience in people's lives that these events happen and significantly influence their career. That's, that's the important takeaway. Not that some trivial event has happened, but these things have actually been career um, influencing, changing uh, events. Because of that, it, hope, it behoves us to have a, a good account of chance events, to recognize them and to think about them and, and even leverage them. Uh, they need to be centrally, uh, a central consideration in a career development theory. In terms of influences uh, on people, th there are a, a multitude, a multitude of influences. Um, one of the co-authors of the theories book, uh, my colleague Mary McMahon, with her colleague Wendy Patton, um, did some beautiful work laying out in their systems theory framework a, a, a taxonomy of these influences, these personal influences and these um, broader influences uh, that come to bear on people's lives. Um, 500 plus influences in terms of your career, uh, that, that number I plucked out of thin air. Um, that number could easily be a thousand and I reckon um, I could probably, if in my Krembolts mode, argue that it's more like 10,000 or a million. Um, but we haven't got time to go through all of those. The point is that everything from your, um, your Achilles heel uh, to um, COVID, to um, your teachers at school, to your family, uh, influence and continue to influence and interact with each other in ways which have an impact in terms of your uh, career. In fact, there are so many of them and they are constantly changing in the way that they influence, people, influence you, uh, that trying to map out all of the different combinations of patterns of influence would in fact end up with effectively an infinite number of different possible outcomes and consequently that leads to uncertainty. We are all dynamical open systems and I think that's a really important point. We're dynamical because we change over time. That change over time could be very, very rapid from literally walking across the road to falling down with a, a damaged leg, or it could be very slow over time, like the aging process generally, or uh, slowly becoming disengaged with your work, or uh, slowly falling in love, whatever it may be, um, these things can happen quickly or they can happen slowly. So you, you, we need to remember that when we talk about dynamic change, it sounds like we're talking about dramatic and sudden change, but it can also happen slowly. I've often talked about this in terms of fast shift and slow shift. Both occur and both uh, and, and both are occurring all the time. And in fact, sometimes the slow shift can be the more pernicious because um, we're not necessarily aware of its effect until perhaps sometimes uh, a little bit too late. Um, I was taken by the work of Professor Lynn Bradley uh, in the Computer Science Department at University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, who um, said all of the systems in the universe that evolve with time, the vast majority of them are non-linear. Uh, so, and in this Venn diagram, you can see here, what we've got is dynamical systems. And the, the idea we're trying to put across here is the vast majority of these things um, are non-linear. In other words, they change in ways um, which are not uh, readily uh, predictable. Small events can have large impacts and conversely, large events can have small impacts on the system. They don't follow the simple predictable, draw a line straight through it type um, classical scientific model, if you like. Uh, in fact, most of the systems which are dynamical and human beings are, are non-linear. Human beings are non-linear. Um, she quotes the mathematician uh, Stanislaw Ulam, who said the study of nonlinear dynamics is the study of non-elephant animals. And what he means by that is, that basically, the vast, if you're going to study animals, the vast majority are nonlinear. If you're going to study dynamical systems, the vast majority are uh, nonlinear. So we need to have a theory which has nonlinearity at its heart. Um, we th th things don't necessarily. Um, have simple cause and effect. Um, I'm not sure how well this video will show, but what I'm showing is Monty Python's fish dance, and the guy's being hit in the face with a couple of very small fish. And the reaction is to take out a very large fish. Not all events uh, have an equal and opposite reaction. Small changes in the inputs to the system disproportionately cause large outcomes in some cases. 
And equally, sometimes large changes can have minimal or no change. Anyone who's uh, suffered an organizational change program at work where millions of dollars have been spent on consultants uh, promising they're going to change everything, and the net result is you've got a new logo and your, and, your, and your job titles change, but apart from that, everything else carries on as normal, except you're out of pocket by $10 million or more. Uh, sometimes large changes don't change anything, and the system resists change, and it, and it reorganizes pretty much back into what it was like before. On other occasions, a tiny change can change absolutely everything. Sometimes just a word in your ear, a post-it note passed in a meeting, um, uh, looking lazily out of a, a window on a train and seeing something that inspires you. These things can change absolutely everything. A chance meeting with somebody just briefly can change many, many things in your life. Um, we need to appreciate nonlinearity and appreciate the implications of that in terms of uh, predictability. Um, here's an example of a couple of pendulums. And if you look at these, these are on a loop. Um, if you look at the top one, it starts from a certain position and it swings in a particular way. And in the bottom example, um, the pendulum is started from a slightly higher position, only fractionally higher, and you get a radically different thing with the pendulum spinning and rotating around. So the initial conditions can change radically what the outcome is. The challenge is we don't know in human beings what the initial conditions are, and we can never really know. So consequently, these nonlinear uh, impacts are not fully um, predictable, uh, but we can begin to describe them after the fact, and I think that's an important point. Um, it makes planning and predictions difficult, if not impossible. We can make plans, but we can have no guarantee that those plans are going to come to fruition or be successful. Um, in, in a wide sense, we're always in the exploration phase of our lives. People and circumstances change. This is the slow and fast shift I was talking about. A, a, a positive in this is in terms of helping somebody in, through a coaching or counseling session, we can encourage them just to make small changes, small steps, because that could leverage nonlinearity, that it may make all the difference. Some people say they won't change unless the whole world changes first, or they need major changes in their life for them to be satisfied. But they don't appreciate that sometimes by starting by making small steps and small changes now could potentially lead to very significant changes in the longer term. And that's something I think that we can leverage a lot in coaching and counseling and also career education. I want to address a point um, uh, that people sometimes in their desire to classify and, and taxonomize career theory and ideas, they, 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 ca they catch on to this notion of uncertainty and link it to chance events and say, oh, well, chaos is really, you know, it's just happens to science learning theory or serendipity. And I want to make the point that chaos is way more. We're not simply saying the world is unpredictable or random. We, we are providing a much stronger account, which comes from chaos theory out of meteorology, out of evolutionary biology. Not, myself and Robert did not invent chaos theory. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, we appropriated those ideas because we felt they applied so well to the phenomenon that we were studying in career development. And one of the most important aspects of chaotic or complex systems is this notion of emergent order. And that is these systems, which are unpredictable and they're nonlinear and they're open, have this tendency to emerge into self-similar repeating patterns over time. And what you see here in these images are what are called fractal patterns. And the fractal pattern is this emergent pattern that comes out of the operation of a complex or, cha or chaotic system. And the beauty of these things is, is A, well, they are very beautiful to look at very often, and they often resemble nature, like flowers, for instance, or butterflies. But equally, you can't fully appreciate the pattern until after it has emerged. You can't predict in advance how it will go. And anyone who's had or raised, uh, had an involvement in raising children will know that you can't predict how your child is going to turn out. And they're constantly a work in progress and they're constantly a work of art and they're constantly changing. But what you can begin to do is to begin to describe things after the fact. And we do this as parents all the time and say, oh, you know, that's very, you know, that's remarkably similar to your grandmother or your grandmother used to like that or your grandfather used to smile like that or what have you. So we, we, we begin to come up with descriptions or narratives after the pattern has emerged, after the behavior has emerged. 
uh, we cannot predict in advance. And when we begin to think we can predict in advance what's going to happen, these factual patterns have got a quality where they can suddenly uh, change on us uh, quite radically. And that radical change is called phase shift. And here's an example close to my heart where you've got a blue colored gin in Australia called ink gin. And you add the tonic water and see what happens. You get what's called a phase shift and it goes pink. The ice in the gin and tonic um, is another example of phase shift. Um, when that is at a particular room temperature, it's, it's water. When you cool it down, it changes its properties dramatically and turns into ice. Believe you me, putting ice in a gin and tonic is preferable to putting water in. It has different properties. So things can suddenly transform and reconfigure in new ways. And you see this reflected in people's fractal patterns. And you see it reflected in people's lives. Um, they can suddenly change. They can suddenly change their tastes, lose their interests, fall out of love with something, lose, um, uh, lose their engagement with their work, or suddenly find a new interest or a new hobby or a new, uh, a new thing that motivates them. Or, External factors can cause these phase shifts by, for instance, illness or injury or by opportunity. So phase shift is a really important thing, the potential for uh, dramatic uh, change. Some of the implications of this are, is that back to that uncertainty idea, because of this pattern, these, these immensely complex fractal patterns that emerge, um, we're constantly looking at ways of trying to describe an individual and trying to sort of capture some of their reality. Traditionally, we've, we've in our field, we've used testing, and, and that's come under increasing criticism for being reductionist and too narrow. And in the last 20 years, there's been um, a surge of interest in, in narrative or story as a way of capturing important things about an individual. And we'd agree, and we think that's a good thing. Um, but I think it also has to be recognized that narrative also is insufficient in capturing the sheer complexity um, of a client. And certainly a singular narrative is, is way too simplistic a way of capturing the complexity of a person. And in theory, you cannot fully capture the complexity of an individual. Consequently, we need as many different methods as possible to help people with their self insight. And narrative plays a part in that for sure alongside sometimes testing. Testing can still be very useful in helping people get a yardstick of where they measure up on certain criteria compared to other people. That can be, for instance, useful in competitive processes like applying for high demand courses at university or for jobs or for a whole range of other things. It can be useful to know where your strengths and weaknesses compared to other people lie. Equally, you can't rely on that solely. The narrative can be useful. But we need to recognize that people cannot be solved. They are mysteries to be explored, not puzzles to be solved. It's not like the mousetrap, Agatha Christie's mousetrap uh, mystery where the, uh, the police officer is able through logic and deduction to solve the crime. Simply, we're not like that. We are much more complex than that. Um, we don't like uncertainty, and that is, I think, one of the things that drives us towards these more simplistic approaches. Actually, we do like uncertainty in certain, under certain circumstances. That is why we uh, like to read whodunit uh, murder mysteries, uh, and that's uh, why we like to go and see films and why we get so annoyed if people tell us what happens at the end of the film before we've seen it. So we do like surprise. Most humour is about surprising people, about suddenly changing the circumstances in unexpected ways. We like we like uh, uncertainty under certain circumstances, but generally speaking, uh, we do not. And because of that, what we tend to do is we try to manage it or reduce it, as I was saying before. And in chaos, there are four ways in which you can do that. And they've already talked about one of them, which is this fractal pattern that the emerges. Uh, and it's called a strange attractor. And it's the thing that constrains our behavior as an open dynamical system. But generally speaking, what we try to do is close ourselves down. And we do that in one of three ways. We either try to uh, set goals or narrow everything down to a predetermined point in the future. And all of our behavior is directed towards that. Or we swing between two different points like a pendulum. So it's either um, plans or it's chaos. And there's nothing in between, for instance, from right back from that early slide. 
And the most common way, perhaps, other than goal setting, uh, is to try to organize things into routines. So everything happens in the same predictable way, and it's like we go round and round on the carousel, and we can perfectly predict where the big yellow bird with the red hat will be at a certain time, and it's going to move in the same way and go through the same routine. And we need routines. We know where we are with routines. We know it's Monday. It must be a work day. We know it's Friday night. We know we've got the weekend off if that's our work pattern. For instance, we like that. It helps us with planning our time and the rest of it. And we can fall into these traps. But unfortunately, um, these things can get um, disrupted through unemployment, through things like COVID, through injury, uh, through better opportunities coming along. Um, life gets in the way and changes the best made plans. So in chaos theory, we want to be listening out all the time to see whether clients are trapping themselves in these closed system attractors that they're too narrowly attached to a goal and are failing to spot better opportunities on the way to that goal. Uh, they're too black and white in their thinking, swinging between two different points, or they're too rigid and regimented and everything has got a routine, a place for everything and everything in its place. And what we want them to do ultimately is move towards their embracing their fractal, embracing this open, emerging, constantly changing pattern, um, which is where the possibilities lie. It's where the hope lies, to use some of the language of people like uh, Norm Amundsen and uh, Skip Niles, for instance. So we're talking about closed and open systems. We need to recognize the limitations of goal setting and binary choices and routines as traps. And we need to encourage openness, curiosity and risk taking and the strange attractor. And I know just to finish off very briefly, want to um, show you an application of all of this that I'm very excited about. Uh, it's been developed by an ex-student of mine um, and who set up a tech startup company. Her name is Liv Penny, um, who are using the chaos theory of careers as the basis for a careers education system for uh, young children, primary aged uh, children um, and above which is highly interactive and is based on this idea of openness and in fostering curiosity um, and exploration. Um, and you can go and have a look at this. It's called Become Education. And it's based on the ideas um, of awareness, constantly uh, being aware of the changing nature of the world of work and the changing awareness of changes in the self, uh, encouraging aspiration uh, and critically, encouraging agency uh, to try and design and implement experiments, which is exactly um, the sort of thing I was talking about as a strategy. Uh, and they have a, a, a lovely um, online um, environment, which is very rich and beautifully produced for uh, kids to explore. And you can see a little video here, and you can go in and see these families of jobs, these poets, lyricists, and creative writers, and you can click on these um, things like a video game and script writer uh, and you you get information so you can explore and expand and the whole thing reconfigures to show different connections between different things to show the dynamic world so what we're doing is broadening people out rather than narrowing them down to some sort of uh, notional ideal but get encourage people to continually explore and do experiments and it's a very rich environment i haven't got time to do justice to the chaos theory of career or some of the applications um, in the time allowed for me today. Uh, but I would encourage you to have a look and read all of the papers that we produce. There's also uh, um, the books, uh, the book mentioned at the beginning and our book from 2011, The Chaos Theory of Careers. We've also collected an evidence base. This stuff works. We've got evidence um, which we present uh, in Brighton prior and since the, uh, the work, the excellent PhD work of Tony Borg and Gerald Torpy, where they've done experiments showing that chaos-based approaches work. In Tony's case, chaos-based careers education compared to control groups. Trent Loder, who's, who's finishing up right now, has also done some great work in schools doing this, Eva Chan, um, and uh, others who have picked up on our work and run with it and done some really interesting things like Lauren Daly and John Schlesinger, uh, doing some exciting, interesting work uh, showing the potential for this, where well, there is an evidence base now, I think it's building, showing that this stuff, this approach does work and it is practical and there are some practical tools that you can use. Um, and I'm going to finish up and have questions and I just want to really acknowledge um,
And what I want to do now is acknowledge um, all many people, and I can't acknowledge all of them, who have influenced my thinking and who have influenced the way I live my life, to be honest. Um, and I've, I've mentioned Robert Pryor, and I'll mention him again. He can't be mentioned enough. Uh, I'd like to thank Sarek as well for supporting me and giving me the opportunity um, many years ago now, in about 2009, I think it was, to give a keynote. And that was a, a great opportunity, and I, it was a big honor to do that and uh, very fond memories of doing that. Olivia Penny had become she's the future uh, and I'm spending a lot of my effort energy working with become in fact I'm the research director for them um, my great friends Norm Amundsen and Spencer Niles the conversations I've had with them their friendship their support and encouragement and their ideas have often said that their ideas um, are the are really good practical counseling implications of chaos bakes work the late John Crumbolt who's a good friend of mine we I was lucky enough to work with him and present with him um, and he's he inspired and he, he was a great, great thinker. And Mark Savickas, of course, um, whose ideas about themes are he's linked to fractals, uh, has also been a, a tremendous uh, encouragement and is, is a great thinker. Tony Botello from Canada, who has uh, recognized the potential and been a big supporter of the chaos stuff and practically applying it in his institution. My friend Tristan Hooley in the UK, uh, doing very innovative work along um, uh, on social justice, um, pioneered by another friend whose name should be on the list, uh, David Bluestein, Peter Malkovin in Australia, Nancy Arthur, who kindly introduced me, uh, Roberta Borgen Nolp, uh, again, has been a great support and has given practical support and hosted me um, in Canada. Uh, Mary McMahon, again, has been uh, supportive, has given opportunities to write book chapters. Uh, and, and to be involved in conferences and, and simply to, to touch base and, and, and talk about ideas and promote uh, career theory as well as a practical work um, and many, many, many others. So at that point, I, I will stop and hand over um, for any questions if anyone's still listening. Hi, Jim. We have lots of people who are uh, still listening. Thank you so much for, for that presentation. So it's Sharon from CEREC who's uh, back speaking to you now. Uh, we have a number of questions, Jim, that have to do with parents. And here's a, a representative one from, from Mary, uh, and in particular about risk averse parents. Uh, she asks, um, young people's parents often want to minimize risk. They want safe plans. Uh, and in particular, she's seen this reflected in an upsurge of wanting their children to pursue careers like medicine because this is seen as a foolproof. So uh, her, her, she would like to know uh, what your suggestions are for educating parents around this. Yeah, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, it, it, in a sense, I think um, uh, parenting, I'm a parent myself, and I, I don't profess to be an expert in that, of course. Um, it, it's a bit like rehabilitation. That, um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of very, very dependent on supports like crutches at the moment. And eventually, hopefully through rehabilitation, I'll get to the point where I can flee the, the nest and I can I can once again um, run wild through the meadows. Um, and it's a bit like that when raising children, that you want to protect them until they reach adulthood and then they can fend for themselves when they leave the nest. I think kids these days leave the nest when they're about 40. Um, Educating parents about uh, this is important and getting them to acknowledge chaos in their own lives is important. And the things you can do, there's a thing online, uh, and it's also in the book, freely available online at jimbright.com slash tests, I think, called the Exploring Chaos Reality Checklist. And it's deliberately designed in a way to ask questions to get people to acknowledge the chaos that's already happening in their lives and the fact that they're coping with it. So you try to build up people, parents' levels of confidence and also talk about it in terms of resilience. Um, how that practically um, links to particular career choices, well, I think then you wanna hit people with uh, information to counter some of these ideas that medicine is the only way. And for instance, you can talk about all of the, all of the exciting things that are happening in the world of, I don't know, social, social media tech startups, a whole range of other alternatives where there's tremendous growth. There's good statistics available on growth prospects in in occupations that can that can help in that. We've also got to respect cultural um, um, differences, and there will be um, some cultural um, environments where 
um, kids are expected to honour their parents and and to and follow in their footsteps. So I wouldn't want to go charging in with some kind of Western individualistic, you know, kids can be free and do whatever they like attitude necessarily. You've got to be uh, culturally sensitive in doing this. But um, I think getting parents exposed to this kind of thinking and to demonstrate that this actually leads to success and gets kids ahead on the curve by making them more resilient and making them more opportunis, uh, opportunity aware and making them more capable of taking opportunities when they arise, um, will get people on board. And that's, in short, I could, I could talk all day on this topic, but that, that's the headline, I suppose, answer. Jim, you mentioned cultural difference, and we have a question from Witty that uh, relates. Um, Lee writes, in the West, we like to think that we are in control. I wonder how the chaos theory plays out in non-Western cultures where uncertainty is a daily reality. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I, 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 I'm i hesitant uh, to sort of answer by sort of saying, oh, it plays out absolutely fine, because how would I know? Um, in my limited experience of talking in a, in, in uh, countries um, of, of, of which have different um, either political or cultural um, uh, backgrounds, um, I'm, I'm led to believe by my hosts that these ideas are um, really do resonate very well. Um, I want to be hesitant because obviously people are kind when they invite you to talk and they're likely to be complimentary. Um, so one can never be entirely sure. But I've certainly, um, cer certainly these ideas appear to have um, resonated uh, in countries where either uncertainty is a daily reality um, or in countries which have a more uh, collectivist kind of culture where um, you're, you know, you are part of the community and part of the group and you're working within that. The interconnectedness and the notion of networks and um, and, and, and yeah, connections between communities resonates in those sorts of societies as I understand it. Um, yeah, and I think, I, I think, yeah, that we, COVID has been a, a big wake up call to people um, in the West who think that they are indestructible, who think they have got systems and sophistication in place to the point that they can't be touched. And this is a reminder that everybody can be touched by uncertainty. Building on that, uh, Beth has a question about the current environment. She wants to know if you sense any change in how career advising is done due to COVID and how it affects the job market. Um, I think, I mean, in the obvious way that people are doing it via um, Zoom and, and, and other sorts of technologies rather than face-to-face -face, um, a lot more. Um, I think that's one of the uh, positive things that have come out of this. We are beginning to see a phase shift in how work is done and working from home, technology mediated uh, coaching and counselling within our own area um, are, are becoming increasingly accepted after years of scepticism and doubt. It's ironic, actually, I think that as a profession that we're actually rather conservative. Um, and, you know, we we ask others to embrace change and, and sometimes find it difficult collectively to do that. I know there are lots of counter examples and inspiring people in our uh, profession who are, are much more progressive. But I do think that uh, that has changed things in terms of the counselling. Um, I suppose the message is, is, um, is changing um, as well. Um, I think things like the five-year plan is becoming far harder. I mean, I've always been skeptical of this kind of approach. Uh, and I think there's a bit of humility coming into um, into what we're doing is people recognize that their plans are being, you know, um, swept away. Um, those people doing it, say, in the university sector are seeing not only um, that their prospects as graduates being swept away, they're seeing their own academic staff being swept away uh, in jobs which were historically some of the most secure in our in our um, labour market. Um, it's it's difficult to with the, with COVID and its aftermath um, to maintain that hope. Well, you must do, of course. Um, but it's I think it's undeniable we're in for a pretty rocky a, a rocky period. And those of my colleagues who are very sharply focused on social justice are already pointing out, you know, the, the um, tremendously 
uh, impactful um, negative impacts of, of COVID on young people, on school leavers and graduates, and, and how this could leave leave them in a bit of a wasteland for possibly the next five or 10 years. I think this has been building up for a long time pre-COVID as well, I have to say, in terms of the casualization of work and highly qualified people ending up doing very basic menial uh, service orientated jobs because there's simply not enough going around. We might even start thinking about uh, about the uneven share of work and how we want to redistribute that at some point. Um, I don't want to get too political in, in this sort of talk, but I do. I do think it raises broader questions that go beyond the, the career counselling um, area. But I would say that the sorts of things that the chaos theory has always promoted about experimentation, risk taking, curiosity, reinventing yourself, all of these sorts of things, strategies at the personal level, I think are worth pursuing. I can already hear uh, Tristan Hooley in my ear saying, hang on, you can't put it all on the individual. Um, what about governments and what about societies? Uh, it's not just about the individual changing. And I, I completely agree. And I think if, if Tristan would say that, and I don't put words in his mouth, but if he would say that, um, I, I would agree. Um, and those, there need to be changes there too. But if it's the counsellor dealing with a client wanting some help at this stage, then yeah, experimentation, curiosity, persistence, uh, flexibility and risk-taking are likely likely to be as good a strategies as any that I can think of and they're the ones which flow from the chaos theory. We are just about at our time but I'm going to squeeze in one last question um, and this one is from Stephanie. She wants to know if you could please share your number one favorite tip to apply chaos theory in work with clients. Um, I suppose my uh, w would be keep trying things, keep having ideas, Keep thinking, keep trying things, keep going. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jim, for your presentation today. Um, it was great to have the engagement from our participants and uh, to learn from you more about the chaos theory of careers and its relevance to our current reality. So thank you for having shared your knowledge with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, just let me briefly share a few final pieces of information with participants. If you wish, you can learn more about the Career Theories and Models at Work book, including how you can get your own copy at sarec.ca slash theories. And our Career Theories webinar series continues with the second webinar of this series. Uh, as Nancy pointed out, I guess this next one would be number 12. And it will be presented by Roberta Borgen-Nolt and Deirdre Pickerel on Monday, October 19th at 12 p.m., that's noon Eastern time. And Roberta and Deirdre will share their career engagement model and discuss strategies for applying the model with your clients during these chaotic times, so continuing that theme. And if the date or time doesn't work for you, uh, rest assured that you'll receive the recording of their session and be able to watch it at your convenience. In the meantime, you may want to join us for some other upcoming webinar series scheduled with CEREC this fall, and that includes a French webinar series on online career development, a series on career engagement specifically for mature workers, which is going to be co-presented by Roberta along with Bill Borgen and Jennifer Luke from Australia, lots of great Australian connections. And uh, finally, we have a series with Tanner, Tannis Goddard on remote career services. So you can visit our website at theric.ca webinars for more information. But for now, uh, please do take a few minutes to share your feedback and learning needs with us in the pop-up survey. And let me close by thanking you once again, Jim, for your presentation, as well as all of the participants for being with us here today. Have a great rest of the evening here in Canada and a great rest of the day in Australia.